I want to welcome Agile XRM to the podcast. I've known the people at Agile XRM for the past 12 years. I've seen how their business process management tool can add massive value to complex organizational processes in sectors such as finance and government. If you have complex processes or a need for dialogues on the Power Platform or Dynamics 365, take a look at how this BPM tool can add value. You can find them at agilexrm.com or check out the show notes for more details. Welcome to the Power Platform Show. Thanks for joining me today. I hope today's guest inspires and educates you on the possibilities of the Microsoft Power Platform. Now, let's get on with the show. Hey, welcome everybody to the ecosystem podcast by Cloud Lighthouse. We've got some exciting announcements to make around Cloud Lighthouse today. But before we get started, why don't we turn over to the two gentlemen on the left? Uh, but in your case, they might be on the right. So we don't know. We'll start with the left or the right. But uh, Mr. Dorrington, Mr. Huntingford, the floor's yours. Hello. Hi. Enough of that. On to Andrew and Anna. Yeah. yeah. Right, right or left. Right or left. It's a wonder they're not sitting on each other's laps. That's the. Uh... Oh, no, they were. They were. The, yeah. The, the, yeah. You asked us not to. Yes. <laughs> I am grouped. <laughs> Always up for a good cuddle. You can see it's the start of the year, folks, that we're, we're, we're trying to get back into the groove of things. Anna, what were you saying that you loved? The Groot Mug. Oh, the Groot Mug. Yes. The Groot Mug. It's very cool. It's so sweet. I think, though, that he really should be drinking from between the eyeballs, right? The bit above it. I was. I have. Yeah. I, I, know it, I don't know why. It's just some nerves. <laughs> drink drink off that. the hair. It's like a weird it really bothered thing. Will. Yeah. He sucked on it, though. You can hear him sucking on it. It's bizarre. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, you can see you've got to keep the suction to stop it dripping yeah, through like the cracks. It's like a chocolate out of a tippy cup. It's, <laughs> this was a big problem for Will in the pre-recording. Mm-hmm. Yes. I'm not surprised. We all we all read uh, Chris's status message from today that he goes to bed at like nine and he's like yeah. super happy to be a middle aged man now. A morgue, <laughs> middle aged white guy. What's up? Is that right? Is that what you call it? A morgue, eh? <laughs> right. <laughs> awesome. So today we're talking about AI, AI for 2024. Yeah. It's I think I think we're we're in for a big year. That's right. And how are we preparing for artificial intelligence in 2024? That's a good question. Let's go around and ask that question. Anna, you first. <laughs> I think we're preparing for artificial intelligence in 2024 by you, by doing first of all taking care of our data. We're consolidating data. We are making sure that we've got governance, that everything is ready for artificial intelligence. And then, frankly, we're using tools. Like, I've seen a lot of stuff going on on, on the Internet. There's a lot of quick wins. Andrew likes to call it, how do you call it, Andrew? High impact, low complexity stuff. Those. And, those. yeah, that's how... Artificial intelligence looks like for me in 2024, being able to bring some value and getting people used to it. Awesome. But honestly, the tooling does bring a lot of benefit, mm -hmm. a lot of value. You just need to know a little bit how to use it. That's all. And there's tons of information on the internet. Chris. So I'm seeing it as like this hugely focused optimization tool, right? Like that's the end business productivity tool. And it's more like uh, a lot of the orgs I'm chatting to now, there's less fear and more excitement, which is really cool. So like we're chatting to a legal firm at the moment and yeah, I mean, obviously being careful, but they're pumped, right? Like they're really excited to get stuck in. They're really excited to start using it and not <laughs> just co-pilot, like actual AI yeah. across the back, right? Which yeah, it's, it's super exciting. And it's not only one company I'm talking to, like we're talking to a few. And uh, the other thing that I've started to find is that I think people are like, yes, they're watching the news. Yes, they're reading the social sphere, but they're less inclined to believe what people are saying. So um, I've started to find it actually quite interesting to see that 
it's not just about like the fear factor anymore. People are like actually getting really excited and therefore I'm getting really excited. So yeah, it's about, it's about productivity and optimization for me, I guess. Interesting. Andrew. Well, so, um, uh, I am preparing for AI in 2024. We're, we're taking Cloud Lighthouse to, to the next level, right? So, um, up until now, Cloud Lighthouse, we've been bringing you the ecosystems podcast. There's, you know, a lot of content on there that we've shared, but starting now, Cloud Lighthouse is going to be, uh, serving, uh, serving clients, serving organizations and helping, um, helping CIOs, CDOs, leaders of organizations to make this transition from being uh, what I always say, a superintendent of a utility company, right? Where you're really just trying to operate the IT infrastructure to being strategic leaders of um, of your organization um, or their organization. So Cloud Lighthouse is in business. And um, that is my, that is what I'm doing full time now is, is working with, working with folks on this. I like it. I like it. Mr. D. Hello. Um, so it's, uh, it's absolutely everything what everybody has already said. Uh, so it's from, you know, knowing our data, making sure we have a healthy pool of data and we've got a, our data hygiene intact all the way through to then looking at our governance layers of that, our regulation, regulatory layers of that through to then actually now we've got that. We've probably got quite a good amount of BI behind that as well. We're finally be able to get the intelligence we need. It's then how do we add more value to it? And that's and how do we mine value from it? And that's where AI really comes in. But your question was, how are we getting ready for AI in 2024? And I think for once, we can answer that in a multifaceted way, which is not just about business, but I was sitting around uh, the Christmas table and the amount of my uh, partner's family that were talking about how they use chat GPT and other AI productivity tools. It's just phenomenal. Yeah. So for one, yeah. we don't just have to answer it from a business and how we're personally preparing the CIOs, the CTOs, CDOs, but actually the fact that we're seeing this leak inside, you know, it's our family and friendship circles mm -hmm. as well. Just to cap that off, uh, then, the, you know, the, the three aspects of that mining value is exactly mm -hmm. how much divide it, which is adopting. So, you know, the democratized AI through co-pilots and everything else, extending. So how do we actually extend that out and make it so we can make it more contextual to our business and then making your own, which is how you build your own co-pilots, your own large language models, which, you know, with so much more advancements from uh, how we're doing uh, prompt engineering to how we're actually optimizing large language models. I mean, the research coming out at the moment is just phenomenal, and I'm sure we'll touch on that a bit later with direct yeah. reference optimization and, and items such as that. I like it. I'm glad you went there because I find that there's a lot of rhetoric around the theory of AI, and of course we've you know we're in the Microsoft um, camp, and therefore we know Copilot has been forcibly fed to us. In all different types of formats, and one co-pilot doesn't mean you know all co-pilots. And I'm really big myself on what I'm terming as practical AI. How can I use it myself to increase what I know? Kind of like in a white paper that Andrew's just released, it would fit in the category of incremental AI, but at a personal level. So I'll give you an example. I was in Melbourne the other day, and there was a time delay between me going to the airport. And I would typically have just jumped in and like, <laughs> what can we do in the area? And uh, why that why everyone's laughing? This is actually taken directly from the the white paper that Andrew has written, and it gave a really good example of how practical you could use it in a daily basis. But what I find is that people. And I don't know if it's it's necessary, but there needs to be a defaulting to, I think, making sure it's much more part of what we do all the time. Like I don't, when I walk into a room, I don't go, do I need to turn on the lights if it's dark? I go turn it on, right? It's there. It's 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 ambient around me and in, in, in the use of energy that way. And I think that we we need to, on purpose, till it becomes natural to a degree, start going, how can AI be infused into everything that I do so that I get comfortable with it, that I can test it, I can validate it through my experience, not just abstract, you know, and how we talk to customers. But that's how we're seeing the drive of AI at the moment, which is like an iFAF service, intelligent, functional, uh, intelligent functionality as a feature, 
So the quickest way to get people to adopt it is exactly the way Microsoft's done it with Copilot, which mm. is let's just make customer service leverages, make sales leverages. So it just becomes part of your day to day. It's yeah. triggered as soon as you go in the pain and it starts reading contextually what you're doing and helping you immediately. Sorry, Andrew, I got uh, the caffeine's kicked in. So I was going to add to that that um, we had uh, we celebrated Christmas with my my mother. She came over to uh, came over to London and. Um, somehow we got, I, I feel like AI is all my family wants to talk to me about right now is AI and our daughter. And my mother asked me, you know, what are you using? Um, how are you using AI versus just Googling something? And I said, I thought about it for a minute and I said, listen, I Google something when I want to know a piece of information, right? I want to know what the pounds to euro exchange rate is right now, right? I, chat with copilot or with bing or with chat gpt or whatever your your flavor is here when i want to understand something when i want the ai to do some of the lifting around assimilating information that i can go a little bit deeper on so for me i'm now using traditional search to just know a quick fact and i'm using ai to help me process a lot of information and assimilate it so that i can understand it a little bit better that also works if you're if you're looking for something that has changed meaning, right? So a lot of the products have changed names, which can be very, very confusing, especially if you're not on the field. You know, if you're not in the field, that, but you've heard about something that happened in like the data field or the AI field or the infrastructure field, whatever, but you've heard about it last year, it's very likely that Microsoft has changed the naming because it's just Microsoft's uh, hobby, really. That's, That's just their hobby right now. So AI is really like super helpful with that, but AI is also very helpful um, when you just want to achieve something like very quick. For example, today I was trying to achieve um, a good reasoning why um, um, I should change my British passport first before my Romanian passport, for example, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. because everyone wants like, Every embassy wants to, like, they tell you, like, oh, you've got a different citizenship. Like, let them do the, make it their like, the hard work first. <laughs> exactly. Make it their yeah. problem. So in order for you to be able to actually get that done, you need a lot of information. So AI helps you to detangle the complicated information a lot, as well as realize what current information meant for last year's view. Mm. That's super useful. That saves a lot of time. The example that Mark was sharing earlier from from the white paper, right, is, and I think that this was my big, this is my big turning point for use of AI in my own life, right? <clears throat> and and to, to finish that story, Anna and I were sitting in Melbourne, <clears throat> Australia. We had a maybe six hours before we needed to go catch our flight. We wondered, well, what, what should we do with our day today? And I could have spent 45 minutes Googling things and put a plan together. Instead, I pulled out Bing. I chatted. Well, now I, now it's now it's been rebranded again, Copilot. But, you know, I pulled this thing out. I said, listen, my wife and I are in Melbourne, Australia. We're sitting having breakfast at this place. We need to be back here to get our bags from our hotel by six o'clock tonight. Um we enjoy um, urban, you know, kind of urban outdoors sort of spaces, architecture, um, that, you know, that type of thing. What should we do? And Bing came back and said, you should do these things and even put them in order to make it into a good walking tour. And within 20 seconds, we had a plan for the day and we reclaimed that 45 minutes back. So that was my big moment about just do this. That's exactly what happened. And And all of that was like started by the fact that we, um, uh, like we planned our entire honeymoon based on AI, you know. So, uh, so, so we've done all that. The entire honeymoon. In fairness, we did ask Mark Smith what the best time of year was to go to Bali. <laughs> <laughs> right but like honestly so one day we're in melbourne and andrew's like i'm gonna look for something for us to do and 
four and a half minutes later, he's like, this is our trajectory for the day. And I'm like, please, you just used co-pilot. Come on, I know you. <laughs> 100%. <laughs> and you're incapable guilty. of doing that for us. It's, <laughs> it's a new level of plagiarization now, isn't it? It's not plagiarizing other people. It's plagiarizing bots and all sorts. It's brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, please. I, I plagiarize everything, Will. You you must know this. I, 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 I copy everything. <laughs> there is some, um, there's a developing story right now about um, uh, the, I believe it's the New York Times mm -hmm. taking issue with OpenAI for having trained uh, its models. It's not just them as well. There's many. There's many. Yeah. Who else, who, who else is in on this, Will? Where, what other... There's a couple I've seen I'll pull out, but it's because, the, you know, it's, there's a load of artists also getting frustrated about it from absorbing their text. But what is your opinion on that, Andrew? You know, you've always got a good crafted opinion on these things. What, what, what would be your opinion on, you know, when we look at GPT, generative pre-trained transform, the pre-trained element so important for large language models, as we know, going through, understanding the nuances, et cetera, uh, applying, uh, you know, uh, uh, attention rates to them, et cetera. We need that public source, should they be allowed to trade on it? I think that could be a, a topic in itself. If you're looking for a structured way to enhance your career in Dynamics 365 and the Power Platform, this is for you. Enrollment for the 90 Day Mentoring Challenge, April to June cohort are now open. I discovered MS CRM in 2003 and it changed the course of my life. My career in Dynamics 365 and the Power Platform has taken me all over the world and the opportunities for people to build a career in the space today are better than ever. The 90 Day Mentoring Challenge will help you chart a path to capitalize on these opportunities and build the skills for greatness. Find out more at ako.nz365guy.com. For the first time, I'm limiting space on this cohort for a more intimate experience. So if you want to be part of it, don't wait. Enrollment will close on the 25th of March. Podcast listeners can use the code PODCAST for a 10% discount at checkout. Yeah, that 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 is one that we might we we might want to pick up for a for <laughs> yeah. for an episode or or, or, yeah. have, or have a guest who's really specializing in that those sort of legal issues. But listen, I mean, my my take on it is that um, as often happens with new technology, is that our legal and regulatory regime around in this case copyrights. Um, really needs needs a fresh look because um, if we deny this technology that information and that knowledge to be trained on then we're really doing a huge disservice um, you know we're doing a huge disservice uh, to ourselves but I think you're on point I think you're on point the rules of yesterday were not designed in a world of today and if you like the it, it doesn't mean that we go no we need to enforce yesterday's rules. You know, should should horses have priorities on all our roads because they had priority before the motor car, right? Should we stay in the dark ages and not move forward and progress as a society? I think those are the, <laughs> That's the rules that, 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 that need to be understood because the risk is we do stay in the dark ages. We don't advance with this technology because somebody's, you know, under the the legal protected system today or based on yesterday – is trying to be applied to the future. So I, I, I and my and my first thing was that, you know, the literature is in everything that's been pre-trained is definitely, as in my understanding, is not be, been behind a paywall or it's not been behind a gated mm -hmm. um, scenario, right? It's not. That's not the scenario we're seeing playing out. If you go back and look at the history of Google, and I remember reading a book on Google years ago. Google went out and bought massive libraries of content, like of written books and things like that, own mm -hmm. the rights to them, et cetera, because they wanted it to train the future and, and this, the searchability of those assets, et cetera. Now, did they pay an incremental royalty back to the authors of those books? I doubt it. You know, I doubt that that was part of the mix, but that was – if you read the history, that 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 went on. I just think that there's folks that are going, hey, let's make a quick buck off these big tech companies at the moment, you know, and America being as litigious as it is, according to every movie I've seen, 
I assume that that's what's happening here, but I'm hoping that the lawmakers will see sense and go, you know what? These laws need to be recrafted for the future. As they so often do. I mean, who, who, what class of people on earth sees sense more readily than a lawmaker? Um, (laughs) I think one of the, one, one simple thing that, that Microsoft does that, that Bing and, and Copilot now does pretty well, right? Is they provide a citation for, you know, where have we sourced the knowledge that we've used to produce this information? And I actually find myself frequently actually clicking on the citation, and not because I feel a need to verify it, but because I want to read more, right? So to me, I'm finding that that some of these AI tools actually drive me towards the source yeah. content in a pretty totally. effective way. Yeah. What frustrates you about it, though? And I'll go first. Um it's already trying to police it too much, in my opinion. I take a photo of this mug, I upload it and say, can you please rep, you know, redraw that uh, as you know, a cartoon? Oh, sorry, we're the you know, PII, that piece we have. So you get this, we can't <laughs> use a real image of a person. <laughs> It doesn't say I'm interpreting what it says, um, but it, it doesn't. I, I think, it doesn't I think that's do a, it. It won't do it. Product enhancement. It, 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 like a kiwi. It, it won't do it. So, like, I what I do is that I I have to message Will Dorrington and go, "What app did you use to do that? Because at least it looks like you, you know, dressed up as Ken and Barbie." Oh yeah, that, that was the thing. You know, right? See comments. I'm hating the limitation that already, and Microsoft need to because they're going to protect themselves legally. But what I've done is like, you know, I I go, nah, I'm going to use stable AIs, you know, where it runs on my desktop, their large language model. And the tweaking in real time that you get, you know, if you want to go further than just the productionized apps that are out there, you've got to, I think, go to downloading them off get getting them on your own machine if you really want to create some creative stuff and that's just to get around that kind of legal risk that the big corporations are worried about if they reproduce your face you know correctly we're covering multiple topics here though because one Mm. is around oversensitivity in european law thanks to gdpr the other part is actually a lot of people making decisions on something that has spooked them because they're not aware of how it works. That's it. And that's mm. the bit that I think if people really sat down and understood how large language models work and the beauty behind them, actually, if you, if you really sat down and looked at how all the various networks get put together, the feed forward networks, the attention mechanisms, all the maths behind it, they'll realize actually, yes, it is bloody clever, but it's nothing to be scared of. You know, and I think that's part of this concern for me, where we, we've suddenly seen this emergence of AI specialists in quotations, which they are, but at a functional level, mm-hmm. not at actually understanding. You know, I've got a friend who I'd love to bring on at some point. I'm sure we will, called Dr. Yeah. Paul Von Loan. He's a doctor of actuarial mathematics. He now heads up part of uh, Amazon's exploratory data science uh, area. But this stuff has been going on for years. It's just the fact that we've made it more public, but it is beautiful maths behind the scenes. And I think the moment we get a grip on that, the moment a lot of this will calm down. However, there are still arguments around what data should we use to train the models. And I think we, you know, using a horse scenario or analogy here isn't actually appropriate to what we're saying around a person's business or IP. But I do think the betterment argument that Andrew hinted to is absolutely appropriate for, for, for here and now. And you could argue, just to extend on your Google search part, which is actually Google and search engines have been representing bodies of text on their page for a long time. You don't have to click yeah. on a Google link to understand what that article is about. They summarize it for you. Mm-hmm. So the argument should have been there a long time ago if there was concern. Yeah, very valid. Very valid. So here's an interesting thing around legalities around tech. Okay. So go and look up a dude called Kevin Mitnick. Yeah. Okay. So Kevin Mitnick was one of the first ever hackers that was actually yep. locked up for fraud. There's a movie and, uh, about him, right? Yeah, yeah. And um, in the beginning, when he started committing the crimes, because it was based on gallo roman law, they weren't actually able to convict him, mm. right? It was, it was a struggle, right? Because the legal, I guess the way the legal rules worked, didn't actually even match the crime, right? It's like trying to lock somebody up for committing something that's so far-fetched. So they didn't know what to do. So they gave him 12 months because they didn't actually have the definition of what cybercrime was. Okay. And like what's happening now 
is that even when you look at the when you look at the legalities around AI in Europe and the stuff that's come out, like I'll give you an example. One of the one of the requirements is, is that you have to prove and evidence how the decision was made and how yeah. the content yeah. was generated. So when you look at like the GPTs, it's a black box. It's really hard to evidence a lot of that stuff. Okay. It would just be generic. It's like this is how it works. Yeah. That's all we can tell you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's, it's, it's the same <laughs> so, as the microphone. So the lineage, you're looking for the lineage of it. Mm -hmm. that, that, Correct. And it's it's really, it's not like an ML, right? The ML, you can see the path. Mm. This is different. So when they're asking the question, and somebody will get pulled out on this, especially for things like ageism, um, all sorts of things like that. Ableism, it, exactly. ableism yeah. all that. It's going to happen. Mm. And when I say it's going to happen, I don't think that companies are ready to actually show how it works. And it's when you look at what happened with GDPR, like subject access requests, that's the same shit, man. Like that was show us your data. Now it's going to be show us how you made, how you reasoned yeah. over this. Yeah. So couldn't agree more. Yeah. 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 We're going to have some interesting scenarios coming up in the future. But from a corporate perspective and using your, using your, using your own data, Microsoft does provide a way of, or at least a diagram of how it works. Broadly, this is how it works, and this is how this is what people are interested in. I think, like if you if you're working with corporate data and you're like, oh my god, all of that's gonna happen to me, you're like, actually no, all of the data that we're gonna use for AI and copilots is gonna come from your own state, and this is how it works. Uh, and I think uh, Andrew, you do have a part of that shown in your white paper as well, right? Yeah, the paper and what, what you're talking about here, right? We can, what we can absolutely do today, right? Is show how, how the technology works at a macro level. What I think we're going to see are increasing calls from regulators and, and in some cases from, from society in a less structured way, right? To understand not how does this work at a macro level? How does the technology work? But Quite pointedly, how did the AI reason its way to this particular response mm. to this particular prompt? And that I think is is something that we we'll, we we'll really struggle with at least today. And and the weird answer to this is actually in the output itself, which is a load of development around prompt engineering. Which, by the way, guys, is not just writing natural language into a into a model. It is there's a lot more science than just that. It is around looking at the reasoning aspect and getting it to detail that. So chain of thought commands, et cetera. It's, you know, just to try and bypass it. But my concern isn't actually Microsoft. Actually, if you look at Microsoft's history of investment, even before mm -hmm. OpenAI, even before Elon Musk and the others got together to get that, they always invested in frameworks and models to look at responsible AI for help because they knew that this, this would be coming and they knew they had to get on the front foot. My other ones is more emerging areas that we've seen over the last 10 years around things like hugging face and other aspects where we can allow developers to go in, same with open AI to a point, but mm -hmm. you can leverage Microsoft's uh, privacy there now. But and the developers are building this without putting that thought in. That's where other risk comes along. And I think that's where EU laws, UK laws and that will hinder us because of that sensitivity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and it's just like <clears throat> I, I think it might have been in Tools and Weapons, the, the that Brad Smith book. Brad Smith book, yeah. Very he good. mentioned there that, you know, if a hostile country decides to disregard law or the ethics of law and uh, sorry, a war, war not law, and they advance their AI to do something. They don't care about that the EU has a standard or that the US have a standard, right? If they're competing or fighting against those those countries. And so I think that we're definitely going to see the risk is is that you hamper, if you like, the white hat, um, because you think you're gonna stop the black hat, you know, from doing their their what they're gonna do, and they're gonna do it anyhow. Law or no law, they're gonna do it. We had this user group, this AI user group, um, recently at Bletchley Park where the agreement was signed. And it was quite interesting, right? Because this guy stood up and he was really upset and like complaining about this. And I said, look, dude, this is the human race, man. We'll turn a walking stick into a weapon. <laughs> like, that's what we do. We're idiots. We mess things up. We, um, and, and unfortunately, because of that, they have to take like over precautionary protocols. But you're right. Like you can't, hem you can't hinder growth because of the black hat.
No, yeah, yeah, absolutely. You just can't. We're, we'll always make. We'll always take something, make it better. We'll always take something and make it worse. Yeah. Yeah. And we just got to make sure that we're, we're in the middle, trying to make sure both those things. One of them can happen. One of them can't. It's yeah. it's just the way we work. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's been great talking to you guys. We'll see you on the next show and we'll drill into a bit more detail around the new white paper released by Cloud White House and Andrew Welch. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Hey, thanks for listening. I'm your host, business application MVP, Mark Smith, otherwise known as the NZ365 guy. If there's a guest you'd like to see on the show, please message me on LinkedIn. If you want to be a supporter of the show, please check out buymeacoffee.com forward slash nz365 guy stay safe out there and shoot for the stars before you go a quick reminder that the 90 day mentoring challenge kicks off on the 1st of april every cohort i hear people say that surely this group has been the best one ever the true magic of the 90 day mentoring challenge is the connections formed between a group of people who are committed to learning with and from each other will you be part of the best cohort yet. Use the code podcast for 10% off at checkout. Visit ako.nz365guy.com to see a detailed curriculum and hear what past participants have to say about the challenge. I can't wait to help you discover the unique value you bring to the community and just how far you can take your career.